Good evening and welcome to McMaster University for this evening's special public lecture. My name is Joe Kim and I'll be your host for the evening. Tonight's public lecture kicks off the second annual McMaster Symposium on Education and Cognition, which continues on to Thursday and Friday. The speakers in this symposium will explore how cognitive principles can inform instructional design and critical issues in education to bridge the gap between the comfortable controlled conditions of the lab and the much noisier reality of the classroom environment. If you're interested in attending the rest of the symposium, please see one of our helpful uh, student volunteers in black at the reception desk uh, that you saw at the entry. I'd like to extend a special thanks to the McMaster Institute for Innovation and Excellence in Teaching and Learning and the McMaster Alumni Association for their continued and generous support of events like tonight that connect the university with the wider Hamilton community. Following tonight's lecture, I'll moderate a panel of McMaster 3M award winners who will reflect on issues in education policy and practice. I have not uh, told them the questions ahead of time, so they're a little bit nervous. <laughs> uh, please then join us for a wine and cheese reception, which will conclude the evening's events. Our speaker for this evening is Dr. Pippa Locke from the Department of Chemistry at McMaster University. Over the past seven years, Pippa Locke has developed a strong and well-deserved reputation as an outstanding professor in the Department of Chemistry. She excels in the classroom and her teaching evaluations are consistently the highest in the department. Let's keep in mind that she's teaching chemistry and not something inherently interesting like psychology. <laughs> Nevertheless, Dr. Locke loves the challenge of making the abstract concepts of chemistry come alive for first year students. Her introduction to chemistry classes are big on interaction and participation and even includes skits where students act out chemical equations. When I asked Pippa to tell me about her most memorable teaching moment, she recalled walking down the hallway during the, uh, near her office during exam time and seeing students reenact one of the skits done in class to explain an organic chemistry reaction mechanism, using the reenactment to help their study. Dr. Locke is one of 10 educators across Canada to be named a 3M National Teaching Fellow for 2014 by the Society for Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. Little known fact about Pippa is that she once sang on stage with Luciano Pavarotti in February 1999 as part of the chorus during the rehearsal for a concert he was about to give. Unfortunately, the concert never happened, but that's sort of besides the point. <laughs> Dr. Locke's enthusiasm for learning extends to the scientific investigation of learning. She's actively engaged in research to improve education and regularly contributes to communities of practice on pedagogy and scholarship of teaching and learning. From this foundation in scholarly teaching, Dr. Locke will present her lecture on blending instincts, practice, and research to create constructive interactions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pippa Locke.
actually one of my favorite moments. I feel like I could have walked out of the room and you all would have been just fine for the rest of the session. No problems, but I can invite myself back. Is there, a, are there one or two people who would be willing to share what their positive experience was? There's no, absolutely no pressure. Just an open question. Anyone who feels safe enough to share, what was your positive experience? There's one. <laughs> in third year, I took a course, and it was sort of the first time that we were uh, told to actually think about things critically instead of just memorize things for textbook. And also, that gave us opportunity to interact with classes to kind of talk through ideas that we had thought of ourselves. Thank you. In third year, I recall taking a course where I was asked to think critically and move beyond memorization, and that also prompted opportunities for discussion of ideas with peers. There one more. I saw half a hand. <laughs> there. Hi. Um, late night in our computer lab, when we were working on Minecraft thesis with a number of other peers who were working on thesis, we tried to come together and help each other solve problems and we couldn't make our analysis work. And just really working together with these peers, helping one another. Thank you. Late night thesis crunch time, working on our projects, and a group of peers working together and helping each other solve problems, supporting one another, helping each other through that intense time. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. So, my story begins, um, well, this the part of the story begins in June of 2005 when I was attending an education conference and I was overtaken by a cri de coeur which had been brewing for some time and it just kind of it, it popped its way out one night, and I, turned, I remember turning to my partner and expressing my consternation, frustration. I can't just lecture anymore. What do I do now? And so, because I wasn't satisfied with it. It wasn't satisfying. It wasn't, uh, there, there could be more. And so that's kind of where part of this journey begins for me. And I was teaching in our large introductory chemistry course at the time. This is a course that's offered to between 1,500 and 1,600 students. And if we include the engineering sections as well, let's call that 2,500 students. So I was part of a large group, but each person functioned individually in the classroom. So there was sort of an oversight group, but really what happened in the classroom was up to each individual person. And so I felt a bit like a lone wolf. And I guess the question is, what can a lone wolf achieve in the midst of this group? And I did what I could. I started doing things the way I had a sense that they could be done. And I started in my own section. And I tried things, I refined them, I reflected on them, and I kind of held those seeds ready, waiting for an opportunity to grow. And I'll come back to, to this slide in just a moment. Um, in late 2006, our department was ripe for curriculum change. We were about to revamp an honors program, build a completely new honors program, and there was also a mandate to completely change what was happening in first year chemistry. And so we had the idea to, to, to start building what that new course would look like. And uh, I had the opportunity to pilot some of those ideas in the summer of 2007. And um, that's why I have this picture of Louis Pasteur up here. Pasteur was a chemist and uh, contributed to other fields of science and medicine, created the process of pasteurization, for sterilization, and I mean, did a whole host of other work, including creating numerous vaccines. And it's an excerpt from a quote of his that led me to bring his picture here today. This, the quote, the, the excerpt that appears here, the conditions were right all of a sudden, and so it was possible to take those seeds and see them come to some fruition. So, how do you build an instructional team? And um, if you're gonna leap into the unknown with people, it's a great idea to get bonded, uh, pun intended. And, uh, <laughs> and so we didn't go skydiving, but we went out to dinner a lot of times, which is really useful for building relationships outside of work and finding out who are these people that are gonna work together. And identifying those people happened in a variety of ways. We were having these, uh, these committee meetings and there were people expressing all these great ideas. And I thought, I don't even think they hear what they're saying. We want them as part of this. And there were other people who showed up and said, oh, I wanna be a part of this. And they were the right fit. And none of these people had taught in year one before. 
So it really is a large leap of faith or practice to, to come and teach first year science students. It's one of my favorite things to do, but it's not for everyone, and it really is unknown territory if you haven't done it before. So keys to building the team, listen, listen some more. It was critical to provide encouragement, to facilitate discussions, to mentor, to listen some more, and we've continued to listen to each other over the course of many years to keep things uh, in healthy relationship. One of the first things we wanted to do as we set out to build something new was to vision what our desired outcomes would be for people who would be coming through this course and also for the instructional team as well. So we got some professional help to facilitate those visioning sessions and we spent time creating together statements, a vision statement and what the outcomes would be and refining those. And that was a critical part of our process. One piece that we really wanted as an emphasis in this course was to bring to life how chemistry is at work in solving major societal problems, how it's at work in our very day-to-day -day lives, and how the chemistry in both those places is connected to the very fundamentals that we, we need in our course, because students go out from our course to a bunch of other courses and programs, so we have to set with them a good foundation. But we also wanted those applications to be part of the core content. So they're not fluff, they're not window dressing, they're an important part of what this, this topic of chemistry is. So I'd like to just, just briefly mention some of the examples that we looked at as a team. And I would kind of come at this from the idea of, you know, if I were the student learning chemistry, I mean, I, I might just naturally want to be there at 8.30 on Monday morning learning chemistry. I can see you smiling. It's one of my former students, excellent student. And, uh, but others, maybe not so much. So why should we care? And part of the, the way for us to answer that question was to think about, well, why, why do I care? Why am I so enthusiastic about chemistry that I just can't wait to get up and share it with people and get them involved in it? Some of the examples that we took a look at, um, hydrogen as an alternative fuel source. So looking at uh, the chemistry of, of fuel cells involving hydrogen and some of the practical and chemical implications. Um, the importance of using non-lead-based paints in toys. My kids really love that picture. They're, hey, that's Thomas and that's Percy. So they can connect with this talk as well. <laughs> the importance of access to clean water for supporting health. The use of fluoride in, uh, in teeth to prevent cavities, but also the risks associated with, uh, with too much fluoride, so fluoridosis. And um, even extending that to looking at countries, um, perhaps uh, some developing countries, where there, uh, there naturally can be groundwater with a very high fluoride, con fluoride ion content, and the chemical means that can be used to remove the, that fluoride before the water is used for consumption to prevent the fluoridosis. A beautiful symmetrical molecule, dichlorodiphenyltrichloroethane DDT, maybe not so beautiful now, uh, but, but how such a molecule uh, could be such an excellent pesticide against mosquitoes, and yet the indiscriminate use of this pesticide could lead to such an impact on reproduction, for example, the, the thinning of eggshells and peregrine falcons and bald eagles. And uh, this is Hamilton, this is Steel Town. There's some great oxidation reduction chemistry in the chemistry of steel, so we had to have that in there as well, and numerous others. So these are some of the things that we started to insert. And um, as Bram Stoker writes in uh, his well-known piece, Dracula, um, it's often what's not quite going well that gives us the best prompt to re-examine. So we listened to our students, we reflected on our experience and on what had gone on, and we realized a few things. We'd, we'd really gone out there, we had put in too many examples. Not all the examples were tailored at quite the right level. And sometimes in the testing, uh, also, that wasn't at quite the right level. And so we'd, we'd gone kind of too low level. We'd asked for some, some recall and some memorization. And that wasn't one of the outcomes we wanted in our course. We wanted to steer as clear memorization as possible. We wanted to get people thinking and applying the concepts they had used. So what we kind of 
discovered is that our assessments weren't always aligned with our outcomes. So what do you do? We go to our raw material and take the pieces that we want, work with it, refine it, and turn it into something more like the desired outcome that we want. Nice picture of gold crystals down in the right hand corner. Now the thesis that's here is, uh, I don't claim this to be a novel thesis, it's simply one that's grounded firmly in my experience and is borne out by the work of others. That uh, when we have our students engaged in interactive activities, then this can facilitate learning. It's certainly it's going to promote engagement with what's happening in the class itself. And so this was another piece that we wanted to build more and more into our course. We've had really good response to this. My experience as we, we build in more and more activities, the student response is very positive. And we use a whole smorgasbord of possible activities. And this includes uh, some live experiments, which I'll, I'll hope to share with you in just a short while. Uh, the skits that Joe mentioned, having people act out chemical concepts and equations. Peer-peer teaching, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and a variety of other techniques, including um, classroom response systems. So we'll just look at a few of these for a couple of minutes. Some of you may recognize the, um, sorry, I have to walk around a little bit. The, the person, the person in the, the photo here, um, who's gone? Eric Mazur from Harvard University, well-known physicist and contributor to physics physics education, back to the northeast, I'll walk around after, um, who has long promoted the idea of peer-peer teaching uh, and a variety of other activities that, um, that make for a, a very non-traditional looking classroom, not a traditional lecture-based classroom, something quite different. And this was something we were quite interested in. And so what we've got in in peer peer teaching is hopefully a student who has just jumped the hurdles to learn a concept able to work with someone who hasn't quite been able to cross those hurdles yet and can because of their own, ex their own experience in going through those hurdles is well positioned to help that other student that other peer colleague through to an understanding of the concept and that's one of the arguments that I would make is that someone who's just crossed those hurdles is actually one of the best positions to help someone else because they're so close to the process that they've just been through. I can do, a, I can do some things to try to help that understanding, but it's, if it's a, a fundamental chemistry concept, fingers crossed, is one that I've jumped the hurdles for a long time ago. And so I won't pretend to remember what it was really like to get through that. So we like this idea of peer-peer teaching. We also want to move students to a place where they can bring their metacognition to good use. How much do they understand about what they actually know or don't know, what they understand or don't understand? So one of the pieces of educational technology that we make use of is a classroom response system. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with this, it's a, a handheld device. These days it can even be a cell phone where a student can input an answer to a question that's posed to the entire group. And the results are shown in aggregate to the class. So the, the wonderful feature here is that to the class, each student has their own anonymity in terms of which answer they selected. They know. And maybe the person next to them knows if they were talking about it. But each, each response unit is tied to an individual. So for the purposes, uh, for tracking purposes, for assessment purposes, we can, we can know which, which person gave which answer. That can give us good information. A slightly different activity, which we'll sort of segue into now, and I'm going to sort of warm up to this. This is not a chemistry lecture, but I couldn't resist just, just a little bit. Um, the person down at the right-hand corner of the screen is Professor Ron Gillespie, who's a professor emeritus in our department, and more than 50 years ago was one of the co-creators of the valence shell electron pair repulsion model. Got it? Vesper. Now we got it. The Vesper model for molecular shape. And the idea behind this model is that when we have molecules, we look at the atoms and molecules like these three here. The spheres are atoms and the lines connecting them are meant to show the covalent bonding interactions between them. 
And as we bring in one more, we can see they try to spread themselves out as much as possible. Basically, each atom wants its own space. Or a little more formally, the atoms will distribute themselves as far away from one another in order to minimize repulsions. They all want their own space. And so the, the two figures that we have here in the top left, we have three atoms all connected in a line, top, middle, bottom. And so the angle between the top and the bottom is 180 degrees. We can see top to bottom. In the middle picture, we've inserted another atom, so they try to spread out again. But the maximum separation now is just 120 degrees. Still pretty good. And all the atoms are in, they're, they're sort of in this plane of the screen. They're all there. So these pictures are, are not bad in terms of looking at them from two-dimensional representations. It gets a little more challenging when we bring in the fourth atom connected to the center. And this is a place where I could see students getting a little bit lost. So chemistry is a subject that is very much in the abstract. It's happening on the atomic level, on the molecular level, and learning to visualize that, um, I think it's more native for some than others, but learning to visualize that is quite a process. People spend lots of time and energy and money on creating electronic visualizations to help students learn these animations, um, all kinds of uh, wonderful software that publishers will try to, to um, promote to one for the use in the class, some of which is excellent. But I tend to go in the here and the now a lot of the time. And so I look for different ways to help students access this this concept, this abstract notion of these atoms. So if you're able and willing, if you don't mind up on your feet for a moment, then we'll just kind of work through this together. So uh, I'm going to go back a slide for a moment. And basically, okay, i got to go to scratch and make here for a moment. Basically what we're going to do is turn ourselves into these small but fairly straightforward molecules so you can see on the left, the linear shape is basically hands straight up in the air, hands straight down on the ground. Excellent! Yes, you're doing it. <laughs> the, uh, the trigonal plane involves us taking our hands and just creating the 120 degree angle. I we have some experts here. <laughs> creating the 120 degree angle. Beautiful! <laughs> Excellent! The next one's the fun one because we have to get that three-dimensional aspect in. So we're going to take our, our trigonal plane of 120 degrees, bring the hands in just a little bit, because the angle is only 109.5. Very good. 109.5. And then, depending on your position on the platform, and please don't fall off, take either a step forward or a step back with one leg. You are tetrahedron. <laughs> Here's the extra fun part. Linear. Linear. Trigonal planar, tetrahedral, <laughs> linear, tetrahedral, psych. <laughs> and you're now doing molecular shape aerobics, and this is one of the things that we do in the class. So if anybody asks you what you were doing tonight, uh, please share with them. You did molecular shape aerobics. And really just to show you that you're not alone, uh, welcome to our classroom. We've got some students up at the front, the, the linear, super, super linear, and the trigonal plane here, and then the, the nicely uh, shaped tetrahedron over here. Um, he's actually now a graduate student in chemistry, very excited about that, and uh, thank you for participating in that. You were most gracious and willing. Mm -hmm. We also like to do experiments, and we like to do live experiments, and I've got a couple pictures here of ones that I was not able to bring with me because we really need the, the special chemistry design, designated space over in the Burke Science Building. Sink, fume hood, demonstration bench, no carpet, very important. Um, some of you may recognize this one. Some folks refer to this as the barking dog reaction because it makes this big woof sound as the blue flame travels through the tube. And um, beautiful picture here, um, photo credit to the Science Media Lab from campus. This is the thermite reaction. As you can see, it produces a tremendous amount of heat energy, and so much energy, in fact, that the iron that's produced in this reaction is at first in the molten liquid state. It's an absolutely gorgeous reaction. I did bring one that 
that I hope we can do. And so whoever was going to be turning down the lights, I tried to bring one that would give us that wonderful blue uh, glow-in-the-dark color. So I'm going to start shaking here and cross my fingers. We have a wonderful technician. You can't have her. Um, <laughs> and she assures me that after about a minute or so of agitation, and this is science, so we never know if it's actually going to work or not. <laughs> Still going to agitate. Ooh, that was nice. Okay. So we've got, this is the, uh, what's in this flask is uh, luminol solution. Some of you may be familiar with that if you watch CSI. Um, and the kind of thing that we're trying to recreate here is the same, same kind of reaction that you get if you crack a glow stick. And the glow stick starts glowing and it lasts for a certain amount of time. So this will last for a few minutes. And uh, I just wanted to bring that along for you today. Lights back up. You're most kind. That all credit to Heather. She's our technician. Okay. Oh, there we are. All righty. Now to segue us into the next big step that we took in our uh, in our introductory chemistry course, I've got a, a little phrase here from Winston Churchill. Um, I kind of like this one because it sort of gets us towards this idea of, okay, how do we get students being more self-directed in their learning, taking a little more ownership, taking more responsibility? How do we work with that? So we could do some different things in the classroom. And so this gets us into the idea of a flipped classroom model. And uh, this is an idea that appealed to me because of the teaching structure I was working in at the time. And that was um, teaching first year chemistry in our integrated science program. So I'd just like to talk about that with you for a few minutes. The integrated science or ISI program at MAC is a four year program, honors, honors research program. And I teach chemistry in the first year course. This is a course, one course, that occupies 80% of a student's credits and brings together the disciplines of chemistry, life science, mathematics, physics, earth science, and science literacy through a series of research projects. There's many, many pictures of students at work, including the two top right pictures at work doing some chemistry experiments. And I teach the chemistry component um, now in the first semester, and we have about between 40 and 60 students in a given year. So that's my wonderful small class experience, which I'm very happy to have. And what I've done with this, with this uh, class is adopted a mostly flipped classroom model. So I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes talking about what that looks like. So in a flipped classroom model, basically what we're asking students to do is to prepare to, to learn the content outside of the classroom. And then come into class and in the model that I have with them, we'll engage in a variety of activities together with a real focus on problem solving, and trying to develop problem solving skills and really making use of that peer-peer -peer teaching in order to do so. So just to give you an idea based on this thesis that we had before, the kinds of things that we'll, we'll see, they, they work together in small groups. I provide them with a the problem set, they have to work out the solutions. And one thing that I really love about this is that it allows for differentiated instruction in a way that we can only touch the tip of the iceberg in the class of 400. Um, differentiated instructions where the instructor can interact with folks one-on-one -on -one or one on small group, walk around the room and, uh, and sort of be with people in their question of the moment. And then of course the students are working together to help one another as well. We'll come back to the large group if there's a need. For example, if there's a pertinent uh, skit or experiment that we want to do, if there's a, we're gonna do a check for some misconceptions or how are we with, these, with this material, using the, the eye clickers, and if that precipitates a need for some just-in-time teaching, we'll do that as a large group. But really the goal is to get the students working on the problems. We would have boards all around the room, it's a flat room, not like this. Students writing their answers up on the boards, walking around, taking a gallery walk, checking each other's work, debating, but, 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 editing each other's work, edit, edit back, but you said, wait a minute, that's the best part. 
and checking their own their own work and their own understanding. Did I know how, did I know how to do this? And then creating some individual accountability by having the session um, finish with an exit card. This is a brief individually taken quiz on that day's material on the topic from the day that has to be completed. Feedback on that is given uh, at the next is returned at the next session, and it does count towards uh, towards their overall grade. So there is a bit of a an encouragement to be prepared and actively participate. So that's sort of a snapshot into what's happening in that group of 40 to 60. A little more difficult to implement in a group of 400, which is our typical first year chemistry classroom size, and there are four sections. So we've taken, uh, we've embarked on a new adventure called blended learning. We've taken our first year introductory chemistry course, our first semester course, the big course, and we're turning it into a flipped cl classroom model supported by blended learning. And I just want to pause for a moment and say that much of the inspiration for, for what's coming on the next few slides really stems out of the experience of, of uh, the team that Joe Kim has led in transforming introductory psychology here at McMaster. We really um, benefited and leveraged off their experience. We have created a series of web modules, and these are there to sort of provide the core content, uh, the nuts and bolts for the course. And the idea is that students are responsible to view these, you know, a couple of modules. A module might be somewhere between 13 to 20 minutes, uh, roughly, maybe a, a few minutes longer sometimes. So the students are responsible to view some of these modules before class an online quiz on that content and also previous content before coming to class and then we meet face to face and we can do many of the things that have already been described we're going to check for misconceptions we're going to find out if there were problem areas we're going to do those experiments we're going to talk about applications and rich contexts for chemistry and where it's at work in our lives and in the world and we're really going to focus on developing problem-solving skills and those are some of the goals that we have for the, uh, this blended learning adventure. So I'd like to show you just a few snapshots of um, what we have working for us in the modules. The, the blended learning, again, it's the, the focus I'm about to put is, is on the online piece, which in combination with the face-to-face -face creates that blend. So we've talked a lot about the kinds of things that can happen in the face-to-face. -face. Now we're gonna focus a little bit more the online aspect. So this is a snapshot of one of our units on chemical blending. This would be one of those units that had the molecular shapes in it. And what we can see, a number of features, I'm not sure how well they will show here with this pointer, but for example, the ability down here, sort of bottom middle, to, to play, to pause, to replay. Actually, I'm going to do the walk until the end. Play and pause, adjust volume, replay, scroll between slides, previous and next. And up on the left, where it says menu, the ability to go to any slide within a module, to, to go to any section in any slide in particular. You'll see, our, I don't know if you can see how visible it is, there are three tabs up there. They say menu, notes, and resources. So the menu is the sort of the navigation pane. In the notes section, we've got some features that really I'm really so pleased that these are there for supporting accessibility. There's a visual description, uh, excuse, excuse me, there's a text description of the visuals that are on the slide and a full script. Where does the script come from? So let me step back for a minute. The instructional team model, which I keep mentioning, and I, I mention it because it doesn't seem to be at work in many other places. But it's something that we value very highly in our course. The instructional team model is very much at work in this blended learning course because it's still going to be a team that's teaching those four sections. So the team as a whole has approved the overarching storyline for the modules and the flow of the content within them. A 
colleague and I have scripted and edited the text that goes with each slide and done the audio recordings for those. We've taken turns so that you'll hear both our voices. We have uh, scripted and edited checkpoint questions that will appear periodically throughout the modules. Here's an example of one here. And those are there, um, I don't remember who first used the phrase, but they're there as speed bumps. Like, got it, I think I've got it, got it, got it. Well, let's just check that. How is my understanding of the, the concepts that have just come through? And one thing we really like about this is the ability to give feedback, whether the answer is correct or, more importantly, incorrect. Feedback that will guide the student through to the correct answer with unlimited attempts to submit these and work towards a correct understanding. So we've put a lot of this content together and the folks at our Science Media Lab have taken all these bits and pieces and put them all together for us, created a lot of the visuals, really refined them, and are producing the web modules for us. And it's a product that we're extremely happy with. This course, in its blended form, was piloted this spring, May 2014, and based on the experiences from that pilot, we're refining things for September, which is when we launch out to the 1,500 students. It's always good to pilot small, because emails from 150 students, much more manageable than email from 1,500 students. <laughs> so it's good, to, it's good to iron out some of the, the issues first. The in-class time. Some of it is built on what we were doing before, but there's a lot of new stuff. And the team is now working off what this, this, the lone instructor did in May. And they are together co-creating the materials that will be used in the class in the fall. Because of course, they're all going to be teaching from the same materials. So this level of cohesiveness and working together is something that we really value from the instructor's experience point of view. Some of the, the ideas that are out there to support why blended learning could be a good idea. One will come from cognitive load theory. And so this idea that, um, that we can process approximately seven pieces of information, about a plus or minus two, hence seven digit phone numbers. And um, the problem though is that in a, in a, often in a lecture, we bombard our learners with way more information, more than seven chunks, more than seven bits. And often we don't allow enough time to process that information. And so there's no opportunity to make meaning from it. And if we lose that opportunity to make meaning because we're interrupting the information processing because we're overloading the capacity of the working memory, then we're preventing things from getting into long-term memory. And so the blended learning may help address some of these issues by virtue of the, thing, the features that we saw. I can pause, I can't pause my prof. I mean, you can sort of try by asking a question, but um, I can pause the module, I can replay the module. If there was just one piece that I needed to hear again, maybe again and again, I can review the whole thing. And I can access it when I want to, as long as I have internet access and any platform that has a flash player. So pretty good accessibility in that regard as well. Um, the idea of frequent testing, and retesting to aid retention, is also at work here. So we have the weekly tests, weekly quizzes that the students are performing, which um, we're starting with quizzes that are fairly low stakes. Plus there are the checkpoints within the modules themselves, which is, that those are not graded, they are simply there for a formative assessment. And then the eye clicker questions that are happening in class as well. So we've got multiple opportunities for a high frequency, low stakes assessment. And we've talked about some of the uh, the supports to accessibility that this, this mode allows. Now, I'll just give you a moment to spend some time with this thought from Maya Angelou. This thought for me is one of the pieces that cements for me why we continue to value the face-to-face -face time the age of online. Online courses are here. Flip classrooms are here. Blended learning is here. MOOCs, massive open online courses are here. What's the value added in the face-to-face? Because -face? I'm a firm believer in that. It's the structure that we have. And for me, a big piece of it is that 
opportunity, that emotional connection that happens, that spontaneity that happens in the synchronous live environment right here. I'm meeting your eyeballs, some of you are meeting mine. And that's a piece that it's, it's really challenging to recreate fully online. This is not to say that we should not continue to, to pursue and develop uh, online learning opportunities. It's not a vote against that. It's simply a vote in favor of what can happen in the face-to-face -face time. So with that thought in mind, I have another little experiment that I'd like to share with you. This is one where I'll need the lights down in just a moment, but I just need a moment to set up. I just want to make sure it wasn't right under the sprinkler. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is an, an experiment that is going to be loud, so uh, please, just for anyone who has noise sensitivity, please be aware of that. If you would rather um, exit to the back of the room or the front of the room, this would be an opportunity to do that. For everyone else, I will simply, when the time comes, ask you to cover your ears. Um, please heed that. <laughs> just what I'm going to say. Um, in case you're wondering what I'm fishing for, I'm fishing for earplugs. So I really am serious when I say this is going to be that.
really uh, address this question per se, except to acknowledge the things that, that we already have that are in place that are even so different from just a few years ago, a decade ago, with regards to online learning. Um, it's a great time to imagine what the future might hold, and it's exciting for me to sort of look out and see, uh, see faces that I know are going to be involved in creating what that future iteration of a course or future, iter future iterations of a course will look like. It's a very tremendous, tremendously exciting view from where I'm standing right now. Um, I'd like to thank a lot of people, so I've done it in sort of groups. Um, each of the groups listed here, there are so many individuals in, within those groups who played such a pivotal role in my personal journey and in the professional journey we've had with the transformations in our course. And I'd like to thank all of them. I'm just going to leave that there for a moment so, uh, so that it can be acknowledged. And uh, to acknowledge also, uh, because I forgot to do this, that for the development of the, the blended learning web modules, we really have the university and the provincial government to thank for um, the university working hard to, to access funding for the provincial government to thank for um, creating the financial support that's made that possible. And in closing, I'd like to remember a few chemists and researchers and colleagues who have been instrumental in my own journey. Their names are up at the top right. Uh, some valued colleagues there who have passed on, but have made a lasting impression on me. And uh, I thank them for that. And I thank you for your participation here this evening. Thank you.